Yeah, and Nadu, which you didn't bring up, was is certainly not Im, Im, does not embody any design philosophy that was was just an oversight, and we've said that in writing before. So I don't want to be able to throw that one up as like, no, you did this. That was that's never um, that was never the intent there. Um, but we can't unprint cards, you know. Yeah. Um, once they're made, they're made. The funny thing about design mistakes is that they go on to sometimes be the most popular cards in the game, yeah. um, like cubes and. Legacy decks are just like piles of design mistakes in many ways. They're mm -hmm. just like all of the most egregious things we've ever done. In the arms of the angel, Cubes are just like piles of design mistakes in many ways. They're just like all of the most egregious things we've ever done. to a brand new episode of Lucky Paper Radio. My name is Andy. I'm here as always with my co-host, Anthony, just a catty little minx that can't get enough of the tea, Maddox. Jesus, what, where does that come from? <laughs> I'm always here thinking, like, what's what did I do this week? What had happened? Uh, I, I, what, 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 what happened? What, what happened? What ha wait, what and, did, what and did I don't know. What, what, I don't know what that means. Are we talking about cats this week? What's going on? Well, I mean, we're, we're <laughs> gossiping a little bit this week. We're, we're mucking around. We're mucking around okay. in the swamp okay. with the content creators. I that love are always... rolling around in the content. Yep. Mm. Talking about that hot goss. Slop it let's, on me. Let's dish. I'm actually, it's kind of a serious topic, I guess, we're talking about. Maybe we shouldn't take it too lightly. No, I think we should take it extremely light, lightly. <laughs> Great. Because I think it's hilarious. <laughs> there are many aspects I think are very hilarious, and there are many aspects I think are quite serious, and we'll cover all of them. We rarely talk about the goings-ons in the magic community more broadly, because, frankly, we don't care about almost anything that goes on in the magic community more broadly, because we play cube and that's why we're over here on a little corner doing our own thing not really caring about what they ban in modern or what the latest big tournament is or whatever you know drama from the pro tour where so and so did such a thing and should they have gotten a game loss this is all irrelevant to us over here in cube land and yet when such a big tire fire is burning i can't help but look i mean i watched uh josh lee Kwai and rachel weeks did a little video talking about it i couldn't help but but tune in uh some of uh bosch and roll's opinions it's it's a lot going on. It's been a big week in Magic. Big couple of weeks in Magic. If you are listening in relative real time, you will know we are, of course, talking about the controversial bannings of Dockside Extortionist, Nadu Winged Wisdom, Mana Crypt, and Jeweled Lotus from Commander, and the resulting fallout from that, which got pretty ugly and eventually resulted in the Rules Committee and Wizards of the Coast agreeing that the best thing for the future of the format and the safety of all members of the Rules Committee is for... Wizards of the Coast to formally take over control of the ban list and the format. I think we should go in order, Anthony. There's a lot of... I mentioned when I usually talk about this stuff, but I have a lot of thoughts to share here, actually. And I think some of these details do, I think, touch on game design. I'm curious to know what you think about the proposed format for how they might handle categorizing decks, for example, in Commander, and what our lessons as cube designers might teach us about an attempt to try and categorize the power level or vibes of cards but also i think it speaks to some things about the game more broadly that i think are worth saying that i'm not seeing a lot of people saying so yeah i mean to be honest this was obviously like a thing that i was thinking about because it does raise a lot of interesting topics like you know how do we manage a game how do we manage a community what is like the game design versus uh like the player's agency in terms of the way that the game is is being played like there's so much complicated stuff that's kind of been triggered about this and i was wondering if i suge suggest this as a topic actually for the podcast and as it kind of Ooh, like you settled, little you little pig in the slop just well I, I i was surprised that you brought it up as something that you wanted to talk about to be honest but but also like as i've thought about it more for the last like it's been like a week kind of my my upshot is actually actually pretty simple and I just feel like wow it's it's a great time to be playing cube right now and I'm so happy it is definitely that that's a great time to be playing really cube. all I'm doing but I think it's still worth going through each of these things as you said and kind of uh, breaking down what how I guess it affects us or doesn't or what we I mean I'll come right out and say I think it. it almost doesn't affect us at all like I said if anything I think the biggest impact on us will be maybe a small increase in people interested in cube that are very interested in magic and are really disillusioned by the latest changes or the fallout from it or whatever 
I don't think most of this actually does affect us at all, but I have thoughts on it as someone who's very invested in the game. Let's go step by step. First, the bannings themselves. What do you think of these bannings? Seems good. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and, and it's it's funny that everybody that I have listened to sort of give their their take on it. Their their first thing they say is like, yeah, this actually seems pretty good for gameplay. Like, Mana Crypt is not really a fun card in Commander. It's really explosive. It's really lopsided. And I agree with that. It's just kind of, it's it's not a great feature of the format and it's also just sort of like bizarre and inconsistent like the power nine are banned but like as cube players we don't necessarily we have like a little bit more i, I don't know we, we tend to like look we at are things, free we well we also tend to look at we things are unburdened from a lot of different angles and so somebody would be like oh here's my unpowered cube and it's like well you still got soul ring in there like that's basically the same thing this is a card on the same kind of power level and and i think that's something that most commander players maybe don't appreciate they're like oh yeah that's the power nine it's banned and these are cards that are definitely okay but they have the same kind of warping impact as Moxon and Black Lotus. And yeah, so I mean, it's, it's funny hearing other people's takes on it and them starting with, yeah, this seems good for gameplay. But, and I'm like, well, at the end of the day, like there's a lot of things going on. And I think a lot, a lot of what comes up is the financial aspect. But this is a game. If the goal of the game is to have fun and you're, you know, spending money on it in a responsible way, shouldn't you want to be playing the game in a way that is more fun? Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to argue against these bands from a gameplay perspective, from a game design perspective. And I'll say, I think we're mostly talking about Mana Crypt and Jeweled Lotus here in the sense yeah, that that course. was I'm the biggest you fallout. You didn't even need to mention the other two. Yeah, I mean, I think Dockside Extortionist is something that the Rules Committee had flagged as something they were looking at. So I think people half expected a ban to come down eventually. And at this point, no one's surprised if Nadu gets banned in anything. Nadu is going to be banned from the United States of America soon, and it'll be fine. No one will, you know, blink an eye. Mana Crypt and Jeweled Lotus was really the focus of the fallout and i think the ones people were most surprised to see so i think it's mostly what we're talking about here i don't see you can argue against these as from a game design perspective like these are not cards wizards of the coast would design today i mean ironically well hold on a second yes okay (laughs) (laughs) jewel lotus is a card they designed very recently in 2020 Uh and i think that's an interesting point actually like mana crypt is a card that was not in a set it was mm-hmm. printed in some books. You could buy a book and you would get a Mana Crypt as a promo. It was never designed to be drafted. And who knows what thought was even given to anything resembling the idea of an eternal format at the time it was printed. I mean, a lot of the early Magic cards, they really just feel like they were exploring the design space. It's like, okay, we have a couple different resources. We have mana, we have life, we have cards. How do we just like we make have cards flips? that trans- transfer between different resources? And this one is like, okay, this is pretty powerful. It gives you some mana, but drawback in terms of life. And, and I think in the early days, it's pretty safe to say that life was massively overrated. Exactly, as a, yeah. As a resource. Just look it's, at the, it's importance. The classic boon cycle. You might remember that Ancestral Recall get, draws you three cards. Uh, the white version of that card gains you three life because, or prevents three damage. Uh, because, yeah, this is the cycle of three and we're dealing with the different resources. And I don't want to overstate, like, Richard Garfield knows that Ancestral Recall is better than Healing Salve and knew at the time. Like, yeah. I, I don't think there's any illusions that they expected those to all be of equal power level but the game was also designed for a specific a, a very different audience than who it turned out became the players and yeah there's lots of reasons why it made sense to have that power level imbalance you see it in tons of cards in the early days just that you know power and toughness of creatures was way smaller like the idea that your life total was under attack at all times like i, I think the idea of using your life as a resource really didn't exist in the early days of the game. It was like, no, I want my life. I have to protect it. The same way that a player that learns the game now will lightning bolt their opponent's face on turn one, because it's like, you said I have to get him to zero, so that's three points towards zero. So yeah, Mana Crypt was a card that, completely understandable in the sense that it is broken and, you know, shouldn't have been printed or whatever. Jeweled Lotus, I mean, <laughs> the R&D team has said that it was a mistake in hindsight. They would not oh, have really? done it. really? I didn't hear that. Yeah, I watched the weekly MTG, which had Aaron Forsyth and... Gavin Verhey on to talk about Commander, basically. And Gavin said, yeah, uh, Jeweled Lotus was a mistake. They've also copped to the fact that Arcane Signet was a mistake. These kinds of things they are just like, we don't do this now. And, you know, I know that now seems like... Yeah, what's now? Because they did well, it very recently. Well, Jeweled Lotus was designed and originally printed in 2020, which okay. was four years ago. So but also in, that means in... it was designed six years ago, right? Like, it's been a long time True. since R&D was looking at the card file and deciding, should we print this card or not? And their argument is that in recent years, we have decided to avoid printing cards like this. And you can argue in the comments as to whether or not they've succeeded in that goal. But point being, they admit these things are mistakes. I find it to be, frankly, utterly hilarious that Jewel Lotus got banned, that it was a card designed explicitly for Commander, and then decided that it ruined Commander. It's like a little perfect microcosm of 
what I think are the ways that the format has suffered under the bright lights of Wizards of the Coast's attention, which is maybe a whole other topic we could go into, but it's something we've covered in the show before. I, I honestly think that formats are often at their best when they are on the fringe, when they are mm-hmm. using things in a way that they're not designed to be used, rather than the, in some cases, sole focus of R&D and Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast, the way the Commander has been for the past four or five years. Yeah, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, I think we could take this beyond just magic formats, but like any kind of experience, the fun part is off in the beginning, where you're getting to learn stuff, and you're exploring the space and discovering what's possible. And as soon as something becomes, you know, both sort of like optimized and solved by the community, but then also there's this feedback loop of, well, now we're going to try and support this format and that also means capitalize on the format so we're making a new set we're selling to commander players we need a chase card to get people to buy this and so they invented this new card in order to be that and we're gonna talk a lot about that later i'm sure because that was a big part of the fallout yeah i mean honestly i don't know if we should get go right to this well don't do that yet because i want to say i don't like these bans i wouldn't ban these cards if i were in charge I frankly would unban a lot of cards if I was in charge. I think. Well, yeah. I mean, to say like, oh, we should ban this second Black Lotus, but it's it's we still can't have Primeval Titan. Like, there's an inconsistency in the Commander ban list that is just really laughable. For sure. And to be clear, I think that the format does largely socially self manage. And you know, I don't play almost any Commander. Like, in terms of being a Commander player, I've maybe played six games in the last twelve months, maybe eight. Like. A, so I'm really not involved in the format, but I was for many years very involved in the format for many years that Mana Crypt was around and was, you know, one of the bugbears or whatever. But that's why we have all of this, like, ridiculous discourse about Rule Zero, which is just basically a proxy for talk to people. And I have a lot. And, and <laughs> White guy on a podcast says, I have a lot to say about this. <laughs> well, I've said before, and I'll say it again, I think... The idea of Rule Zero is completely self-evident and also does not work, which is to say that outside of, like, formalized competitive play, which Commander rarely happens in, right? Like, the vast, vast, vast majority of Commander games are happening at your LGS, at people's homes. They are not happening at a Star City Games event or a Magic Con where you are playing for stakes, right? Even at Magic Cons, most of the games, I think, are happening on side tables. You can do whatever you want. So the idea of rule zero being like, if you agree with your fellow opponents, you can ignore the ban list or agree to ban other cards or whatever. That is true of literally any game. To yeah, say that to I mean, say and, that's and, a rule of commander, you can sit down with legacy decks casually and say, ah, oh, we're actually going to agree Brainstorm's banned. You can always do that. It's completely self-evident and it has no bearing on the management of the format. That is... That is- Kind of not true. I mean, Rule Zero actually exists far outside of Commander because it comes from, like, board games. It's like, the idea is, before all these rules, before we get to Rule 1, the first thing, the actual ultimate rule is, these rules are mutable. Like, they're laid out here by a person, and you, the person playing, actually have ultimate agency over the game you're playing. If you want to change any of these rules, do it. And there's a big culture in among board gamers to do that and, like, house rule things. It does get more difficult when you're playing a trading card game where everybody is bringing their own deck because you can't necessarily just say, oh, I would like to play without Brainstorm, and then somebody's going to say, well, I built my deck that is all about Brainstorm or all about playing against Brainstorm because that's what the metagame is. So at the point of sitting down with your decks, you can't really do that. I mean, with some small exceptions, I know a couple people have like a Planeswalker as their commander and they'll have a backup in case somebody is not okay with it. So it's like, I'm bringing the tools to make this adjusted format, but not everybody is like done the deck building with those same conditions unless you're playing with like a really cl- close-knit play group that's doing that yeah i think it's fundamentally incompatible with a game where everyone shows up with their own game pieces. exactly which is which is again like why cube works so well and cube is like the format where rule zero is the rule because everybody is showing up to play the same experience where the same rules modification has been applied and rules modification that can mean what is the band list or what is the list of cards that have been chosen or more extreme things like the cascade cube or the turbo cube but everybody's sitting there buying into the same exact experience, whereas it is asymmetrical if you're saying, you guys have already built your deck, but I built my deck differently. Is that okay? Yeah, but my my point is just that there's no reason to write that down and have that be like the number, well, number zero, the number zero rule for Mm -hmm. the entire format. Which sounds normal to computer programmers. Except, except as a way to basically 
point any of your detractors at rule zero and just say, well, then ignore me, right? Yes. I mean, it is absolutely a little bit of a deflection in that way, For but sure. I think that's also reasonable because, I mean, this whole other topic that I've been thinking about is like, literally, who put these people in charge? Like, they are in charge because they said they're in charge, and... That is, you trace it far enough back, like Sheldon was core to inventing the format. Sure, like, but like again, how does that impact my experience? Like, who do I? What do I care? Who invented it and who curated it? Whatever. And it's like, yeah, I think that it is. It is correct for them to say, like, we are the authority, but only kind of a little bit. And if you like to play in a different way, please do it. Like, this is just a suggestion that we're making to the community that we think will lead to fun games, but. Again, you're the players. It's up to you to actually take into your own hands the, the agency to create a fun experience for you and your your playmates. But as we've talked about... Playmates is a weird word. Yeah, don't say that. You and your but, compatriots. You and your lovers of card um, games. Yeah. Yeah, but as we talked about, it just doesn't it doesn't work. Like, for all of the fact that they say rule zero, like, how many commander games do people really say, I'm actually going to play with these four banned cards, and I prefer you don't play with these three cards? Like, it does not actually really work you go to an lgs you're playing with random strangers and there's only so much you can expect social interaction to fill in the gaps for what i think is honestly a fundamentally broken game yeah i mean i think commander it sucks it's a bad (laughs) game i like playing commander sometimes i like designing decks this is not a shade to anybody that enjoys it it's certainly not shade to people that designed it but it is fundamentally flawed and the fact that we have all of these rule zero social expectations and like you have to have a you know dueling ted talks with your opponents to figure out whose deck is more of a seven before you sit down to play and then maybe have a chance of having a game where you have a little bit of fun that is just evidence to me that like the game system the rules as laid out by the game including the ban list from the rc or whatever does not carry the weight of a fun game experience for all the players. You have to have this layer on top of it. I mean, it's a very weird kind of social experience because when you're playing a game, obviously you want to win. You're trying to win. There's a goal that makes the whole experience make sense. And even if the the goal is kind of a patsy or a, what do you call it, a MacGuffin, it's still important to give structure to the experience. And so you're going to want to optimize and try and win more. And the the challenge with a casual format like Commander that's trying to say... Actually, you're going to have more fun if you play in this kind of de-optimized way. That works great when you happen to serendipitously end up at a table with people that are playing in that sort of same level of de-optimization. Right. But then to force everybody to say, play in a de-optimized way very intentionally and everybody be on the same page of how much de-optimization we're doing, that's really, 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 really difficult. Really difficult to manage. And like, obviously, that's been the like the core thing that people argue about other it than should we ban Soul Ring. Discourse, yeah all the time and i mean again i cannot just stop saying enough like that's why i love playing cube it's like if everyone's deck is a three or a four or a six but it doesn't matter because everybody's drafting from the same pool of cards so we solved that problem great and and I'm, I'm this has been another thing that's just sort of been on my mind is like is commander actually a more flawed format than others and if cube for example got as much attention both from wizards of the coast and like as big of a community would it start to show its cracks in the same way and i kind of feel like no. because of that aspect of, of course not everyone sort of tightrope walking how much do i need to play in a not correct as far as like optimizing win percentage way it just kind of it's really kind of fragile i think as a game cube is near perfect in the sense that it's so vague and amorphous it could be whatever you want but the fact that you literally sit down oh did you just say it's a uh, rule zero is important <laughs> no it's not a rule zero it's the thing, it is the codification of that sure you can sit down and have no conversation with your opponent you can sit down and try and spike it as hard as you want in fact the expectation is that most players are going to try and win at all costs yeah and the experience you have is dictated by the game by the game rules you don't have to have all these other social niceties or agree that if i draw my fast mana i'll just discard it and draw again or like all these ways to dance around the fundamental problem the mechanics of cube is perfect the social interactions of cube are a huge massive hurdle people mostly don't want to play with someone else's cards people don't want to have to buy sleeves and and cards and sleeve up you know 500 cards so they can try and convince their friends to get exactly seven of their friends together so they can draft their cube in the ideal way. That is a massive hurdle to a near-perfect game. 
That's a really funny, like, I don't disagree with you, but it's a really funny sort of situation how we've gotten retrained to this different experience, because if you were just playing a board game or any game before trading cards were invented in 1993, yeah, somebody would own the board game. They would bring it. You, you're, of course, you're playing with other people's things. And we've just sort of been retrained yeah, to like, Commander's no, more popular than I'm any building board game. my thing <laughs> and I touch only my own cards, except when some people touch your cards a little aggressively, but that's, that's a different story. <laughs> but my, to me, Commander is the exact opposite. I think it's a fundamentally flawed game. I think the game of Commander is not designed to be optimized. It is not designed to be abstracted. It is, does not bear the weight of making sure everyone has a fun experience, which is what a game is meant to do. But on the flip side, it has all of the accumulated weight and force of all of the rest being so easy. People love their collection of cards. They love to design their deck. They want to show up and show off all of their cool blinged out versions of their favorite cards. They want to show off the combos they put together. They want to express themselves with their deck. And the deck building process, it's, the fact that you're starting with the seed crystal of I'm building around this just makes it it's so awesome. much easier it's to incredible. focus on what are you doing. It's, it's why Commander is so successful. And you have this like tension in Commander where it is so much fun for that reason and then you try to actually play the game, and you have to bend over backwards to try and find the right pod, have the right Rule Zero conversation. You know, there are endless podcasts and YouTube videos describing how you should have a Rule Zero conversation, how you shouldn't have a Rule Zero conversation. And, and I think, to be clear, it's, like, worth separating a little bit. Rule Zero is about, like, customizing the rules, like, changing the ban list. I want to play with silver board cards. I hear it used a lot more broadly. And I, it is used more broadly, but I think it's worth... You love inventing thought technology. I think it's yeah. worth distinguishing the Rule Zero idea of customizing games and the pre-game talk of just like what are you looking for from your experience and is it cool if i have you know this like fast combo deck yeah i think it's reasonable to separate pre-game talk from actually you know rule zero as in modifying the fundamental rules in some way but if you put both those things together and also tack on all the rest of the things that are great about commander which we've mentioned before like there's so many amazing things about the format there's a reason it has become the way to play magic and has completely changed the landscape of the game it is a fantastic format that is brilliantly designed. I still think it's completely fundamentally flawed as a game system, and it gets by on all of those other great attributes. And I mean, to be fair, like we can sit here and be like, look at these commander players that have to have all these YouTube videos about how to have real zero conversations, and we're over here making podcasts like, here's how you get your friends to come to your house <laughs> and maybe play your cube. If you cook for them and give them like a bunch of time heads up, and then you tell them 30 minutes before you actually want to start, maybe you can get the right number of people. Like... To them, it's laughable. Like, you can go get a commander pod right. right. Yeah. Like, I could walk out this front door and probably find a commander it's, pod. It's literally commander night at our LGS. We could go. Well, I, I and, could and, find a commander pod most, between most. here and the LGS. I'm almost certain. Like, you're tripping over commander pods everywhere you go because people are so eager to do all those things we talked about, right? Just and it, stepping on, on them like lantern flies. So we each have our own challenges, right? Like, Cube is not perfect. I think... The game system you just is, said it was perfect. Oh, no, the game did. system. The, the overall format has all these problems. We talk about them all the time. So Cube is not perfect. Commander's not perfect. But for me, I would have almost no ban list. And I would say, look, we have social expectations for a reason. We have rule zero for a reason. It's impossibly easy to say, hey, my deck has mana crypt in it. Is that cool? And the fact that that proved to not be sufficient... As Bosch and Roll said, it's just proof that Rule Zero can't do anything. Like, Rule Zero cannot function if it couldn't manage a format that had Mana Crypt and Jeweled Lotus in it. Easy at the beginning to say, these are my deck. Easy to say when you draw them, oops, we didn't talk about this. Is this actually cool? If not, I'll discard it and draw again. The fact that Rule Zero cannot solve that problem and that it had to be banned is just evidence that Rule Zero fundamentally does not work. So do you think that... Wizards is now saying, well, we, we're, we're experimenting with this new, like, thought technology we're developing of how to structure your conversations about breaking your cube into, or, sorry, <laughs> uh, breaking your commander deck into brackets of power level based on whatever. Like, do you think that's just a, a totally, do you think that's just a, an enterprise that just is doomed to fail? I think we should come to that at the end. Okay. Because that's kind of the most recent development. But there's a lot of other stuff I, have to, I want to talk about between the bannings and that sort of proposed solution by Wizards of the Coast. So these bannings happen. The next thing to address is the massive, massive backlash, which some of it is anticipated and reasonable. People are mad about bans. They didn't want the cards to be banned. They disagree. They have a different view for the format, and they want to voice those opinions. Fine. And then it got very, very ugly and turned into personal threats of violence towards members of the Rules Committee, and specifically Olivia Gobert Hicks, because she's the woman on the Rules Committee. And that's for that reason alone, she got by far the biggest amount of DMs and threats and whatever. So much so that the Rules Committee even came out and said, we literally never do this, 
But we want to tell you that Olivia was the one person that voted against this ban you're so mad about, so stop being so <laughs> to her. It's crazy. It is crazy and also completely predictable. I would have said... Yeah, but that's that just that doesn't make me feel better about it. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't. There was a, a tweet by Dana Roach, who's a magic personality of sorts, came across my timeline. This was after the bans, during the fallout, before any of the Wizards of the Coast stuff. And he tweeted, The last day or so has shown us that a not insignificant portion of the online EDH player base is emotionally and mentally unwell, and I'm not quite sure what to do with that. And... I think that's a good point. I feel similarly. Yeah. And look, a lot of people are unwell right now. <laughs> we we don't talk about politics. In, it's, not a, it's not a political show. We don't talk about politics in this show. But I think we're living in a time of like massive disillusionment and people that feel completely out of control living in a world with a completely uncertain future where they feel like they have no ability to affect the world whatsoever. We're living in a time when automation is replacing tons of jobs and wealth disparity is at an all-time high, and there are tons of people that are trying to make a living in the gig economy and just being treated inhumanely at every single turn. In a lot of ways, you know, in the very, very big picture, this is a better time to be alive than any other time in history, but also in a lot of ways, right now is a kind of time to live. And none of that is Magic's fault, obviously, and none of that forgives threats of violence or terrible behavior of anybody on the internet. But in this world... Magic, for a lot of people that I have known personally, you have known personally, and I'm sure many, many others out there, magic is, for so many people, like, the one good thing in their life, or the one place where they feel some semblance of control, and I think that's at the root of so much of the toxic in the magic community, like, r slash free magic, and, you know, neckbeards that salt off and scream and flip tables when they, you know, get a removal spell pointed at their threatened commander or whatever. Maybe they get their, their revel and riches countered on turn 40 They get their revel and riches negated or whatever. These are people that I think are struggling, and they are putting way, way too much into this game. They are leaning on this game for too much. And, again, I... I don't want to sound like I'm coming to defense of any of these people because I'm not. I'm not. Def- I do not wish to defend or condone their behavior at all. It's deplorable, and everybody should look into themselves long and hard if they spend any amount of time sending personal attacks of any sort towards the rules committee or anybody else online about a stupid card game. It's a card game, but I I have seen it in people, and I understand it. And why I think it's worth talking about is because Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro have been cashing checks on the back of those people for 30 years, right? Yeah, I mean, there are people like me that, you know, I can buy a few too many secret layers and then be like, well, I feel like kind of a dupe about doing that, but I'm not the person that's, like, been driving Lyft after working a job all day and, like, literally my one night a week that I have some thing that feels like is, like, an outlet for me to have a good time is to play this game of magic and maybe you're not coming to it from the best attitude because you've been treated like all day or treated in this totally anonymous way that increasingly technology is just making us like it's just has this incredible force to disconnect disconnect and isolate people that i mean i could go on for hours and hours about (laughs) my bleak thoughts about technology but yeah it is incredibly isolating and and frustrating and that's gonna put you in a weird spot yeah and it is not uncommon I can say from personal experience again and reading anecdotes online that people spend way more money on this game than they should. Way more money than is responsible, right? Again, you and I, we spend some money on the game, but we can afford to, right? And it's a a privilege to be able to do that. There's a lot of people that spend all their money in the game. They're saving no money. They're living paycheck to paycheck, and any additional cash they have goes towards buying singles. There are people that go into debt to build out their commander decks and then live in debt because of this game. There are people that are in debt right now that won't sell their cards to pay off that debt because they don't want to, because the cards mean that much to them. I think it's something we need to talk about as a community in whatever sense the magic community is actually a community, which is a whole other conversation. Community, yeah. <laughs> we could just go down this tendril. Community, stop meaning a collective, a collection of people that support each other and are invested in each other's future. Now it just means a group of people that share one thing in common on the internet. A group of people that get the same recommended posts from the Twitter algorithm yes. popping up in their feeds. They're a community now. To whatever extent the magic community considers itself a community, I think it needs to look long and hard at the fact that magic is a game that is designed to prey on, like, addictive 
parts of the human brain. It's it's called cardboard crack kind of flippantly, but lots of people do spend completely irresponsibly on it. And this is only to point out that when we talk about banning cards and the financial fallout of banning cards, and however you want to define that, right? Like Jeweled Lotus now has next to literally no application, right? Uh, I, I just, Max from our local playgroup pointed out that apparently in Legacy... Right, there you is can, a weird combo deck you can that lets you longer copy your deck mana. with doubling cube. You can copy your mana with doubling cube, which then the copied mana, you can then spend on anything. The first three mana, you still can't spend on anything at all. Mm-hmm. That, that doesn't get changed. And there's like, somebody has like, as a joke, made a deck that kind of uses it. But the card is effectively useless. It was designed and printed for Commander. It's only legal in Commander. It only works mechanically in Commander, and now it is banned in that format. And it was previously... A very expensive card. You know, I think the cheapest printing was on the order of like seventy or eighty dollars, and the more expensive ones were hundreds of dollars. Just to correct the record here, really the cheapest printing of Jeweled Lotus before the banning was more like a hundred bucks, give or take. Clearly, I'm not that plugged into the price of Commander staples. Mana Crypt has a, almost as equally no place to play. You can play it in Vintage. There's very few people playing Paper Vintage out there, and I think most of those people are not that worried about the cost of their cards. So. You know, these cards went from being things that were of value to people, and I want to be crystal clear, you should not consider your magic cards part of your personal wealth, a a liquid asset. You know, I think people do think of it that way. Like, people have posted in our Discord, I lost lost X hundreds of dollars of pure cash this week, and it's like, well, you you didn't. That wasn't cash. It was a piece of cardboard. Uh, You shouldn't treat it that way, but people do. People People do, but some people also, like, if you're managing a store, you kind of have to. Like, that's the way your business operates. Well, we can talk about them. I mean, that's a whole different thing. Like, the the fallout for LGSs is a whole different question, which, yeah, I mean, I think moves like this by Wizards of the Coast, and, you know, this was a move essentially by the Rules Committee, but I frankly think that the fact that Wizards of the Coast is now in charge of the format is probably good in the sense that I think they kind of effectively were before anyway, and we just didn't know about it, right? It was just sort of, yeah, I mean, there was this weird sort of extra entity, but like Wizards was printing the cards, like they had much more impact on the way the game was played than whether or not a handful of cards are banned or not. It's also completely unreasonable to think that those people on the rules committee were just have no connection completely our, yeah. ignoring what wizards of the coast wanted thought cared about was invested in like they were in close contact with wizards they had to be because they held the keys to wizards of the coast cash cow and so if anything i think it's like all right fine at least that facade is gone right now it's just you control the format it's like much more clear it's frankly a crazy thing to try and describe to anybody right like i imagine a lot of edh players probably have no idea what the rules committee is i would not be shocked if it was a majority of players that did not realize there was a separate entity oh it definitely depends on how you count a player but if you count people that just sat down Own and played at least one any, commander deck then for sure the majority have no idea what the rules committee is and that this is even a thing and to try and describe it like oh yeah actually the people that print the cards and publish the ban list on their website they don't decide on that it's actually this other group of people that are organized in some ambiguous way that is not clear, and they have a relationship to this other set of people, the advisory group, that who knows what their relationship is. Like, it was all this complicated laundering of responsibility, and like it or not, now the responsibility falls clearly on Wizards of the Coast. As a company that purports to value its relationship with this network of local game stores that are run completely independently, or just card sellers online, like vendors that are selling singles, which are a very vital secondary market to how the game functions, this massively undermines trust in Wizards of the Coast in the product for those companies that, yeah, they're running a business. It is a liquid asset for them. They're treating it as such. The reason individual players shouldn't think of their cards as part of their personal wealth is they're not treating it like that. Most people don't have their cards insured. I think most people wouldn't take the dollar value of their decks or their cube or their collection and just take that much cash and put it in a backpack to go to the local game store or you know, throw it in their car or put it in an Airbnb they're staying in and go out to dinner. Like they, they're not willing to actually sell them when the market goes up, right? People talk all the time about the like unrealized value of their cards. When in reality, the vast majority of people are going to sell their cards for buy list or below eventually. Like you can talk about this, you know, supposed value you have in your collection, but it's not value until you actually sell it. And most people don't. And so you're not treating it like a thing of value in that sense. Yeah, I mean, trying to think about this also just makes my head spin because economics makes no sense and it's just kind of black magic. It's like, what is what is value even worth? Or like, what, what does it mean that something is valuable? Well, it means somebody is willing to spend money on it. And so if we're saying these cards now are no longer useful, nobody wants to spend money on them, but 
the people out there would still be willing to spend so much on the game. Let's like set aside the idea of like trust being eroded and whatever. Like sure. let's imagine everybody is still just as invested. Then overall, there still should be just as much value available. It's just shifted around now, right? So which like, you can see in like on average, vault going up in price or whatever. A on bit. average, like most people are not losing any quote unquote value, right? Maybe. Well, no, I mean like. I mean, yeah, like there, you can talk about the micro level of somebody that got this card for their Christmas present or their birthday present because it is October uh, and then it gets banned the next day. Like that's going to suck. But those stories are going to be the vast minority and most people will have some like other cards in their collections and maybe it kind of comes out in the wash. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I don't care to make the case for any like broad level economic impact of his decision. I think what matters is the erosion of trust with sellers and people on the secondary market. And what matters is just people feeling bad that the card they like and treasure and got signed by the artist and, you know, was something they saved up money for or got as a big present for something. It's just something they can't play with anymore. Yeah. And to me, this is why I'm against these bands. To me, Commander should be the place to play those cards. And that means that some decks can be degenerate and broken, and you should talk about that ahead of time, and some decks can be totally casual and weird. But to me, a huge part of the success of that format is that it was a place to play your cards pretty much no matter what. You can play any card you want there with very few exceptions. And these were hugely popular cards, so now those exceptions are much longer. I mean, I agree with you. I also disagree just because I want to say, like, I'm not here to say what Commander should be, but, like... I will say one of the things that was the biggest downsides to me of the format was that there was this class of cards, Mana Crypt, Soul Ring, I mean, Soul Ring most of all, Arcane Signet, that are like, if you want to build a good deck, put these cards, like, start here. And it's like, well, you're just chopping off three cards in the creativity of every single deck. And that sucks. Like, I think that is pretty bad and boring but to for, the point for of me, the format, at least. You can always choose not to do that. And I do. Some of my, I like, do too. my favorite deck does not have it has a single artifact in it one artifact my favorite deck not soul never had mana crypt or soul ring either it did have dockside extortions but it was a goblin deck it's gosh darn deck. it oh, it God, was a monocolored goblin, goblin deck it was a monocolored goblin deck so you know it was certainly not the greatest offender of you know abusing dockside extortionist but it is weird to me that so many people are saying these bands will make the game more fun but and it's like why is that not the bottom line why is more fun not the thing that we are most focused on because i'm not sure it will hmm. like what is the net fun i think for a lot of people the fun is playing with their cards and that's true okay but let's take it let's let's think about it in a different way uh let's think about the future and all the other new cards that are going to be printed do you think that like I think we could interpret this move by the rules committee as them sending a signal to wizards. And I, I think about the time when they banned Golos, that was them sending a very clear signal in the way that they talked about that banning, saying, this is not a card that's good for our format. It's too flexible, too many decks play it, and it just ends up like washing out too much of the format and making decks uninteresting. And I think Wizards responded to that and said, well, we're going to stop printing cards like that because we hear the way you want to play the game. And if they say, well, we're banning Jeweled Lotus and Mana Crypt, Wizards, please stop printing cards like this, maybe they'll listen. And so maybe we have two more cards in a ban list, but the potential future was another dozen cards like this three years from now. I mean, if you want to talk about that, I think realistically what this does is it opens the door for Wizards to print something a little worse than Mana Crypt and Jeweled Lotus that is now the new auto-include that they can then sell with the same veracity they sold Jeweled Lotus and Mana Crypts over the past couple years. Or just a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is another big part of the reason people are upset is that, again, this is these cards, these two cards specifically have been a cash cow for Wizards of the Coast. Yeah. They have sold... That's what I think is so funny is they, like, they branded multiple of their products on this is the chase card, this is why you yeah. want to buy this set, and then... They both got reprinted last year. Yeah. There have been 11 individual printings of Mana Crypt since it came back in Eternal Masters, which was kind of the first like modern era reprinting of it. There was like a Judge promo and some other weird stuff, but it got reprinted in Eternal Masters, then the Kaladesh Invention. Then since then, there's just been 10 more unique printings of Mana Crypt. Granted, I think six or seven of them were all in Lost Caverns of Ixalan, where they gave us one for each color, but like they have been making these rare and collectible and chase cards explicitly to provide value to their products right and sure they can't talk about the secondary market or whatever they're not supposed to say yeah we know that there's a certain amount of value in this set but that is plainly what is what these cards have been used for and for them to sell so much product on the back of these cards and then turn around and ban them I, that's why people are mad and it's completely justifiable i think i think it's kind of cool <laughs> to be honest <laughs>
I want to touch on proxies here because I know there's going to be people that are like, haha, lulls, you should just proxy everything. And we have historically been very pro proxy on this podcast. And maybe this is a good time to clarify more precisely, at least my take on this, which is that I'm pro proxy in the sense that I don't think anybody out there should be barred from playing with a magic card because they don't have enough money to afford it. It is it is crazy to sit down and play games with your friends and to say, oh no, you're not allowed to play that because you didn't spend $400 on it. Or $4,000. Like, like Bazaar of Baghdad... That is a crazy thing to say to somebody. <laughs> Bazaar of Baghdad is a fascinating and completely unique game piece. If you want to put it in your cube or casual deck, I think it is ridiculous on a like human level to suggest that someone can't do that unless they drop the down payment on a car on a piece of paper. On the other hand, if you're like in that culture and you've spent the many thousands of dollars to have that privilege of playing that game piece i guess i get why somebody would show up to a commander game and be like no Ooh, this feels gross because i spent the four thousand dollars and you didn't i th- that behavior to me <laughs> is just completely unacceptable and irredeemable right but i think that we should be aware of that like you're saying i it's, wonder it's, how much it's, of that actually it's exists, worth to be discussing honest. like the way that this game is challenging for financial reasons i think that's part of it i, I think it is part of it i think there's a lot of other aspects too. And to be clear, my stance on proxies is, like I said, nobody should be barred from playing with a game piece because they can't afford some ridiculous old collector's item that's on a reserve list from 30 years ago. I think that's preposterous. I also think if you can afford to buy magic cards and it's one of your favorite hobbies, you mostly should. You should play with your cards if you can. If everybody proxied everything, we wouldn't have new cards. We wouldn't have a big network of local game stores for us all to go play our games at. We wouldn't have a vast secondary market. We could go buy whatever singles we wanted and could put on events for everybody to attend. Like it or not, and I I don't, we live under capitalism, and that is the thing that keeps this machine moving forward. So when you're able, if you can, I think people should mostly play with real cards. And when you can't, I think proxying should be completely acceptable at all casual levels. Just because I always have to say it, I don't mean making cards that are like facsimiles attempting to be fakes or knockoffs of real cards something that's clearly not a real magic card but stands in for one so that you can have the gameplay experience that the card offers is that generally your position too yeah i mean i i do like to have real cards and all my cubes are real cards i have collected more avidly in the past and i do think it is like again this is why there's this weird tension it is fun to open up a booster pack and open up an expensive card and i enjoy the fact that i have a a sizable collection with a lot of cards that i can look back on and be like for example here's my mana crypt that i opened in eternal masters that is still in one of my commander decks uh i guess Next time I play Commander, I'm gonna have to in put four a, months. I'm gonna, gonna have to, go to put a planes in there or something. So yeah, I mean that's just my personal preferences. I do like to own real cards, but also yeah, I mean increasingly like the scale of the financial investment that I have and many other people have in this game just feels kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean I have very few things proxied in any of my collection too because. I have a little bit of disposable income. I got no kids, a double income household or whatever. Like I can afford to spend a little money on my hobby and I'm happy to spend money on magic cards for the most part because I love the game and I want it to keep getting made and I want all the software to keep being supported. And I want this vast network of things I rely on for my hobby to keep existing. That said, when I designed the dinner at Microcube, I was not going to go out and buy a Bazaar of Baghdad, an Ancestral Recall, a Time Walk, a Time Twister. It was just never going to happen. I don't have the budget for it to try and scrape up the budget would be completely irresponsible but so i just proxy those cards right and for everybody that line is somewhere else right for some people that line is you can't buy actual power which is mostly where it is for me i've spent a lot of money on magic cards over the years and for some people that line is you know you really shouldn't spend 50 bucks on a card you know you're living paycheck to paycheck or whatever and i don't think that should mean you shouldn't be able to play with the card you want to play with i mean for some people the line is also not strictly just about a dollar amount it's these are cards i think are cool and i want to own and i don't think lands are cool so i'm gonna proxy all my 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 mana base and it's like sure fine Yeah, that's my stance on the proxy thing. I don't think it should ever be a barrier to someone playing the game. I understand why it is at competitive sanctioned levels or whatever. I'm not talking about that, but at casual tables, I'm happy for it never to be a barrier. But also, I think you should try and spend money on the game if you can, if you can afford it. Yeah, I mean, this is another place where I just feel like Cube just makes it so much easier because, again, like I sort of get when people have weird feel-bads about if I'm playing with my real cards and you're playing with your fake cards, what's going on here? is complicated but cube just solves that because it's like we're all playing from the same box of cards whether or not they're proxied or not yeah this touches on this aspect of the game which i really dislike which is this idea of like consumption as self-expression 
Ooh, yeah, this is a good topic. It's a deep one, and it applies to things that are not just magic, obviously. But suffice it to say, it is a pattern in a lot of hobbies or things people call hobbies. I, for example, am interested in mechanical watches. I watch videos about them. I own a few. And a lot of people call collecting mechanical watches a hobby. To me, I wouldn't think of that as a hobby. But there's a lot of places where we live in a society. We live in a society. <laughs> Here we, we are. We, we, live got, we live in a society. <laughs> we live in a society where consumption is the most broadly acceptable form of self-expression. And the deepest holes one can fall into all share a core trait, which is that there is the illusion of a sort of ladder to climb. And I liked Bosch Reynolds' video on this topic a lot. I'll link it in the show notes. Brian Koval had like a little over an hour video just talking about these bands from his perspective and what it means for Commander and for CDH. And I think Brian overall is one of the most level-headed and reasonable people in the Magic community, so I'm always appreciative to hear his take. However, I did think that his points about the value of these aspirational things in Magic really spoke directly to this consumption as expression. He describes his getting his first piece of power, which was a Mox Emerald, and realizing that this thing that he previously perceived as inaccessible, too expensive, just out of reach for him, actually was within reach. And that was something he could now strive for. That striving makes it feel like you're progressing to something, like you are leveling up. And this happens in the mechanical watch world where people like just spend more and more and more money on a watch as they, you know, get more invested in the hobby or whatever, they make more money in their career. And they have this goal, these grail watches of like someday I'll work my way up to this watch. And this I mean, is a- and, and also like much less uh, obvious ways in, in practices that we just think are part of normal life. I'm almost finished with this book on refrigerators and a big part of it is like how do we sell refrigerators and make them an aspirational thing such that you're you're buying into this kind of lifestyle and you need to buy into the new yearly style every five years where we're just going to change little things even though fundamentally it hasn't really changed like this is just very suffused throughout our whole culture yes and I'm not sure how many people will buy a... I mean, that's not true. I guess you do buy a refrigerator self-expression. It's part of interior Absolutely, design. Yeah. It's part of how you express your values or whatever in your life. But the fact that magic cards are not functional things... The, the new refrigerator that has a different style of door is also not functional if you compare it to what you already had. Well, but compared to a magic card, it does keep okay, your food yes. from spoiling. <laughs> I mean, mechanical watches are functional compared to magic cards, and that's laughable Accurate. because you can just get much better time from your phone at any moment in the day, or you can buy a $9 Casio watch and have perfect time forever. Magic cards are even less functional, and having oh, this... you can play a game with them. That's functional. <sighs> sure. It is, I guess. (laughs) But having this ever-increasing ladder of depth that you could invest in the game is a very toxic little loop. It's a poisonous little loop that, you know, the existence of cards that you will not buy because they're too expensive helps justify the you purchasing cards that you probably shouldn't have bought in the first place, right? We all have that time we remember getting into the game and thinking, oh, I can just buy singles. These cards are all too expensive, though. I will never spend more than $5 on a single. Mm -hmm. Like, we've all had this thought. And then I bought a Golgari Grave Troll (laughs) for $9. I remember buying a Wheel of Fortune for $14. This was my first card over $10. I bought Wheel of Fortune for $30. This was my first over $10 card. I remember these specific purchases so clearly. (laughs) I remember thinking, this is so dumb. Why am I doing this? And but, like, I, I do want to acknowledge also that, like, they do it for a reason. It is fun. I enjoyed that process of ramping up and buying more expensive cards. It, it was is, effective and satisfying. Everyone does. It's, it's built into you biologically. It's why it appears in all these other places. And what we need to be critical of, or at least conscious of, is the fact that that runs so deep in the magic world. And... I love Brian. I'm sure, I sh- shouldn't say there's no chance he's listening because so far our record for that is not good. But I doubt you're listening, Brian. But if you looking do, forward to having you on the show next week, Brian. <laughs> if you do, I, I love you. I think the idea that it's good that we have these aspirational things to save up for that are essentially just massively inflated luxury goods deserves some critical thought because that little system, that little like vicious cycle is how you get people that just spill themselves into the game and overspend, lose their lives in it in a way that is not good or healthy for anybody. 
I, I agree, but also I do want to go back to thinking about the kind of person that, you know, magic really is kind of their only outlet, and the fact that there is, it, it presents something to hold on to, and I mean, magic is a great game, I'm very invested in it, obviously, and I don't want to begrudge anybody for also being invested in it and for not necessarily having a second outlet and i i don't i don't want to say like you shouldn't do that if like what are you what are you going to replace it with no that's the thing is i i'm glad you brought this up because you're heading off a lot of comments at the at the past i'm sure people will still leave those comments and not listen to what i'm saying right now i in these situations will almost never ever blame the individual like i do not think it is your fault if you are spending too much money on magic and you're out of control i don't think it's your fault if you are too invested in this game and you have nothing else to sink your time into. It's the system's fault. It like the game is designed to thrive on that for people to spend more money than they should is a capitalist wet dream. It is why this product is what it is as a, as a commercial product. It's why Hasbro is a billion dollar company because of Wizards of the Ghost, because of magic. Many billions. I mean, what magic made like $6 billion in revenue last year or something? I don't know. I also don't know what they say when they say a billion dollar company. You mean the total valuation? I guess probably what but they what mean. But what does that even mean? <laughs> you know, what is it? Look, it doesn't matter. The point is that like, it is a massively su- successful product because it preys on these parts of the human brain and the, and all that is to say that, Again, not condoning or forgiving any of the individual behavior to people in this backlash, but this is all wrapped up together, right? Like, you can't embrace Wizards of the Coast printing Jeweled Lotus and Mana Crypt and reprinting them and selling them as these, like, premier parts of a product and and intentionally limiting supply to keep values high, right? Like... Yeah, I mean, it's it's invented scarcity just like crypto and NFTs was. I mean... Thank goodness that's... Not over-ish. not to bring up too much like comparison to the luxury watch world because it's even more alien and unrelatable to normal people, but like Rolex is a incredible example of marketing success. You you learn when you get into watches that like Rolex makes good watches, right? Like they're not like just a purely inflated luxury brand like some others that are just designed to sell rich people crap that is actually poorly poorly made rolex makes good watches not the best watches far from the best watches and what distinguishes them from everybody else is their ability to market them like crazy and manufacture scarcity and it's funny how much criticism justifiably rolex gets in the watch world for manufacturing scarcity they make more watches a year than any other company and if you walk into a rolex boutique you they won't sell you a watch you have to build a relationship with the authorized dealer and you have to oh, buy other things first and you get on a wait list. Extremely gross. It's inc- it, it's so gross and people are justifiably mad at it and they should be. It's disgusting. They do it because it works and we don't talk about how Wizards of the Coast, the job of R&D to some degree is to manufacture scarcity for this commodity. They could just print Mana Crypt, ec- like to say that, oh, Mana Crypt's so expensive so there's no way to make the format accessible except by banning it they could just mail, mail everybody a mana crypt for free here's a promo mana crypt every, just like they do for soul rings every lgs gets 500 of them that each cost us 35 cents to print and you give them out to anybody who shows up to fnm for six months right like they could just do that but they don't and I, I just think it's worth interrogating the idea that like these cards are good and wizards of the coast is universally good and it's good they print all this new product for us but then also people shouldn't overly invest in the game or get mad when uh, a card they love and considered a core part of their identity or their personal wealth gets banned and devalued massively like you have to the the problem came long before that and this is a symptom of how invested we are and maybe we shouldn't really be interrogating those more fundamental aspects of our relationship to the game is that kind of what you're saying yeah, but again, I don't put the ownership on every individual to just get good, right? Right. Like, but you can put the small burden of like self-reflection and awareness of those systems. I think the best thing we can do is talk about it collectively. Yeah. And we should all know and be aware that when we're the next- enjoying participating in this system of massive engagement and farmed scarcity. Yeah, and Aaron Forsyth said something during the weekly MTG stream which i was actually really impressed blake rasmussen is the guy that i think always runs that 
weekly MTG stream. I don't watch it very often, but I think he's always there. He was kind of the host of the conversation with Gavin and Aaron. And one of the first questions he posed to them, I thought was one of the most like hard hitting real questions. And he said, look, people in the community love Gavin. That's why Gavin's here. It's why he's got a core role in the commander product, but they don't trust Wizards of the Coast and they really don't trust Hasbro. And they really valued the fact that the rules committee was a separate entity that had no financial stake ostensibly in the format, but instead was just there for the love of the game. And what do you say to people who are concerned that Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro being in control of this thing and having a fundamental financial interest and profit motive is going to be bad for the game? Which is a fantastic question and could be the entire topic of this episode. And Aaron Forfset's answer was, I think, predictable, which was basically like, Aaron said, look, I'm also in it for the love of the game. So is everybody that works on Magic pretty much. And that's true. Like, you can't get a job at Wizards of the Coast except maybe in, like, the legal department. Probably even there, they expect you to know how to play Magic because it's such a competitive place to work. And the game is so popular. There's so many Magic players that want to work there to hire someone that doesn't like Magic when there's probably umpteen qualified candidates for your position that also love Magic. Like, I have no doubt that everybody working at Wizards of the Coast also loves this game. And so Aaron's point was, these goals are one and the same. Like, I also want what's best for the game. We also, at Wizards of the Coast, want Commander to last forever. We want Magic to be a thing that lives on for eternity. And it's not that... I don't think Aaron's being deceptive or, like, lying. I think he has to believe that. He believes that because... You can't be in that position and not believe that you would have left that job a long time ago if you didn't believe that your motivations to sell a lot of product to people and make the game popular were one and the same motivation as making the game healthy and successful for the long term. But I fundamentally don't believe that. I think those things are fundamentally at odds. And at the end of the day, Aaron Forsyth's mortgage is paid by his career at Wizards of the Coast. And if push came to shove... I'm I'm a I'm a Marxist. I I believe that ultimately, like the systems and the money describe how decisions are made more than individuals will. And him describing that actually this is the same thing. I thought was a really concise way to be like that's the fundamental difference between how I see this and how I think the best intentioned and most generous and kind and hardworking people at Wizards will also see this differently. Yeah, I mean. If you're working at GE designing refrigerators, you're there because you love designing refrigerators. And the fact that the the capitalist system that forces us all to buy a new refrigerator every five years because the styles have changed mean you get to design more refrigerators. So that's good for you as a refrigerator designer as well, even though it really sucks for the whole system of we could just waste a lot less if we just build good things and we're satisfied with things that were old. I love this new refrigerator focused Anthony. We gotta, I gotta refrigerator hit, I gotta, Anthony I gotta is hit my favorite. I gotta hit my rule of threes. So we gotta <laughs> get the third so mention of refrigerators in here. <laughs> Unless you have anything else about that, I think we should talk briefly about the fact that Wizards is taking over control of the format. Like I said, I think it's probably good in the sense that it's just more clear to the public what's actually going on. I can totally understand people's criticisms that like this is bad for the game because the profit motive is now fundamentally intertwined with the management of the format. I would just argue that it was already, and now yeah, it's more clear. Yeah, I don't think there was... Like, what were they doing to manage the format that was different? Like, do I you think really if on the eve of Lost Caverns of Ixalan being released, the rules committee said, we're going to ban Mana Crypt right now, right before a bunch of boxes go out the door, that that would have just happened, and Wizards would have said, we value our relationship with this independent external committee, which manages the game in a independent way. That would have been so cool. It would have been a incredible thing for wizards to do but yeah. it absolutely never would have happened right i mean it would have like, been cool for the rules committee to do that <laughs> it would have been cool the rules committee to do it it would have been amazing if wizards response was big respect we we respect and uh, you know value your input and abide by this decision but that just simply never would have happened and i think it's plain to anybody that understands the stakes the money involved here that it just never would have happened so i don't think it was independent before and the fact that it's there's not a facade of it anymore i think is for the best Let's close here talking about... Close. We have six more things we could talk about. <laughs> we well, could talk about Soul Ring. We could talk about uh, those other five things. Okay, well, Soul Ring. Let's go, let's go there. What do you have to say about Soul Ring? I think Soul Ring is... It's hilarious to me how much it has become part of the identity of the format. And it just feels like this weird kind of cancer that just... Everybody puts the Soul Ring in their deck. That's the first thing you do. And on one hand... 
I don't know. It's it's strange to me how attached Commander players are to that. And yes, everybody likes to argue about it, but at the end of the day, people are very attached to it. So much so that when they build a Commander cube, they're like, oh, well, everybody has to still have a soul ring. That just like, it just makes my head spin. It's just kind of crazy. And, and it's funny how much it's become tied to the identity of the format that they refuse to ban it, even though it is bannable according to their own rules. Like, absolutely. And I, I do kind of get uh, Mark Rosewater has defended in the past by saying it injects an amount of variance that is actually kind of necessary that if there wasn't Soul Ring, games would just drag out too long all the time. But I, I kind of get that, but kind of am not sold. I don't know. I guess my question is, how would this last week have been different if they decided to... Like, let's let's take them on face value that this was just too much of this effect and having one of them was fine and having both Sol Ring and Mana Crypt was just too much and too many games started out too quickly. And Jeweled Lotus and Mana Vault sure. and Monolith. What if they just banned uh, Sol Ring instead of Mana Vault? How would that have shaken out? I don't want to pretend to guess. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's People it's would have funny, been more surprised for sure. It's a funny question because it's like, okay, you banned Sol Ring. Now everybody needs to you know, cut their $5 card or however much that's worth these days and buy a $100 card in order to keep their deck similar. Like, that would well, be... I mean, th- theoretically, the whole point of banning it would be for everyone's deck to not be similar. <laughs> like, if you... <laughs> but if you're playing the game, you're like, oh, well, I guess I have to replace with the other piece. Like, the fact that they banned the expensive one versus the cheap one is not an accident. Right? No, for sure. It was part of the reason they banned it. I'm and pretty it, sure they said exactly as much. It's crazy either way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they're not going to ban Soul Ring. They've said as much. They're like, look, we're not going to ban it. It doesn't make sense. Gavin said directly on this weekly MTG. He's like, yeah, it's part of the format. Like, logical or not, it's not getting banned. So, you know, don't get your hopes up. I should say he also couched everything in a lot of, we literally just started talking about this 36 hours sure. ago and nothing is set in stone, but he seemed pretty confident that that was well understood throughout the entire, I think Air Forsyth literally said, he said, uh, I've made my peace with Soul Ring years ago. <laughs> <laughs> he also described very You funny- know what they should do? They should bring back Mana Burn. That's the way they should <laughs> fix Soul Ring. Aaron Forsyth also described a very funny situation, which sounded like in the early days of him learning what Commander was where he like showed up to a game and was playing Armageddon and like, you know, strip mine locks and was like told off by the people he was playing with and told to go away and build a new deck. And it's just so <laughs> funny to me to imagine people being like, Aaron Forsyth, you are playing the game wrong. <laughs> Leave and come Get back out. later. Return when you have completed your quest. <laughs> my, my favorite anecdote about Soul Ring I've seen recently is I follow a fair number of judges on Twitter, and there was a post a little while ago about somebody who said they were in round one of a modern RCQ, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they got a judge call because someone had a Soul Ring in their deck, just in their deck in modern, and their opponent just called a judge and was like, what the heck? And that's funny enough as is. And then a fair number of judges responded and said, oh, yeah, I have also seen this. And I think it's cool that people that only know magic through commander are like branching out to other formats and it's so funny to me that people just assume like well i don't see it on the ban list so in it goes i'm gonna put soaring in my modern deck <sighs> yeah i mean it's probably pretty good in modern i would imagine <laughs> yeah i'm gonna go on a limb here and say that even though i don't have a intimate knowledge of the metagame i think soaring is pretty good in modern this is where i want to end i'll give the same disclaimer here that gavin and aaron gave many times over the course of this video i watch which is that None of this is set in stone. These are like the early days of them talking about how they're going to maybe manage this format. But what they are proposing in very soft terms is basically a set of tiers. Four is the number they have presented at this point where cards that are problematic to some degree are put into tiers. And then you identify your deck by the highest tier that it includes a card from. So, you know, the tier four stuff is like Vampiric Tutor and, you know... They put Armageddon in there, which is a testament to them talking about not pure power level, but instead just vibes. And then tier three is like, you know, more expensive tutors or, you know, build arounds that can be infinite combos. And it just works down to like tier one. And tier one is basically like commander precons. Like this is just what we print and put in regular precon decks. And, And I'll confess that when I heard about this, I saw people talking about this on Twitter. I was like, boy, that seems like a really misguided effort, like to try and rank I mean, however many card, how many cards do you even have to put on those lists? I wonder before they're even remotely comprehensive. Like, sure, there's probably a limited number of things that can go on tier four, just if you're calling it the most powerful stuff in the format. But how many things can go on tier two? Like, do you have to just list all of the cards that are better than a precon in a meaningful way? Like, I don't quite understand the idea. My first response was this seems fundamentally flawed. But listening to Gavin talk about it for an hour, I was like, this actually probably does seem like the best solution in that. 
it from on high from the mothership gives them some concrete way to have people start a conversation about their deck's power level. Everything that has been described so far is like, rank your deck on a power level from 1 to 10. And oh, by the way, nobody uses 1 to 5 at all. Pretty much everybody says a 7. And, you know, it's there's no objective measure, right? There's Nobody knows what a 7 is. Here they're like, you can disagree about it all you want. We are saying, this is a 4, this is a 3, this is a 2, this is a 1. And you can at least start the conversation there and say, hey, look, my deck is technically a 3, but I only have one 3, and it's this, and it's in there for this reason. And in as much as it is a way strictly to help facilitate those oh so difficult conversations about deck power level, it seems like a perfectly reasonable solution to me. But I'm curious what you think about it. I mean, I, I really enjoyed April King's take, which is that what was wrong with the old system of uh, rating everything on a seven to seven scale? That worked pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent poster there, April King. I, I think that this is just this is just more of the same problem, which is it's more of the same kind of, um, I don't know, dialogue of Commander is fundamentally flawed in this way for, oh, for, for sure. it to be fun. We have to all be agreeing about the same amount of de-optimization. And I think that for that, for when it is fun, it has to have a degree of informality to it because it is casual. And as soon as you create a rubric, people are going to try and break that rubric. And I think that's what they're struggling with by saying it's maybe cards like this. And here's like opportunity for exceptions you can add, but you're still kind of creating a rubric and people will try and break that rubric and optimize within the brackets and... I don't know. I'm just I'm I'm personally just really satisfied to not play very much commander because I'm not interested in all of that. Like I I just would rather not not do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like the Kobayashi Maru as far as I'm concerned. Like there is no solution to this problem because yeah. this format is massively popular and again, from my perspective it is fundamentally flawed. And so this is like slapping the what's that big sticky seal tape that from that meme where the guy slaps on that boat with a big hole in the side of it? It's got a special name, that big sticky tape. Anyway, everyone's posting it in the comments now for engagement. It's like slapping a, you know, some some duct tape on your sinking boat and trying your best to patch that hole. I can't think of a better solution given the task they are presented with. But I think it really highlights something that is been intuitive to anybody that has designed cubes or especially spent any time talking about cube design with others, which is that you there is no you cannot possibly objectively rank or tier cards it is so context dependent i mean you have a cube where soul ring is not very good mm -hmm. it is a middling pick it is a build around i have cubes where i have made unassuming cards completely broken and I think it's easy for people to know that like, oh yeah, sure, in an extreme case, like you can make Echoing Return really broken if your cube has 100 Ornithopters in it. Yeah, I think people understand you can like do that if you're like trying for a bit. What they don't understand is that every single card is on that spectrum. Right. Every single card is completely recontextualized in whatever commander deck you're playing it in. And to try and say, okay, well, I've got Kiki Jiki in here, or I've got Thassa's Oracle, or I've got Tainted Pact but I don't have these other things that make the combo, but actually I have these other things that people don't usually identify as the ways to make the combo, right? It is just way too nuanced for you to ever say Armageddon's a tier four and Swords of Plashers is a tier one. So they have to accept that it's purely vibes, right? And that's where I think this whole effort might be even more insurmountable. Like I think the idea is reasonably sound in the abstract, again, just as a means of starting those conversations and having some kind of flawed as it may be objective thing like theoretically if they ranked every single card that's legal and commander as one two three or four you could punch your deck into a tool on the wizard's website and it would say your deck is a three and here's why here are your three cards and your deck is a two here are your two cards it is objective and then you can argue about it all you want with your local playgroup whether or not that's reasonable but when they actually try and start making those lists it's going to be <laughs> I, like there's going to be i don't know how they're going to do it it seems like an impossible task it really it does they gave literally Two examples per category, eight, and it has been the the source of just endless Twitter debate ever since those eight cards, which presumably they picked the ones they thought were like the easiest layups or like the ones mm -hmm. that were like most definitive of that category. Like just wait till you see the 60th card they put in tier four or the 200th card they put in tier three, right? Like I, I don't see how this is ever going to work. So even though it's the best they can do in this situation, I don't know how much it's actually going to solve the problem. I would be shocked if it solved the problem. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's just such a weird format because it is constantly trying to solve problems, right? I, I mean, mean, even just fundamentally, the fact that the, the, the 
the format is built around a downside mechanic that now they're like all the new cards that care about copying creatures or cloning things all have to do Ignore this the downside. weird <laughs> exception of ignoring the downside because now they print, you know, 10% of creatures are legendary because it's all everybody wants and they're torn between like, oh, do we make Earl of Squirrel legendary so people can make it their commander or, you know, should we make it legal because it's silver border but then you can't play it in multiples when really it's fun in multiples. It's just like... I don't know. Games are all about designing tension and creating moments of choice, and yet none of this tension feels positive. It just feels challenging. Yeah, it's hard to think of the really good things that have come out of that tension. <laughs> um, hmm. Anyway, uh, in summary, I wouldn't ban the cards, and I'd probably take a bunch more cards off the ban list if I were in charge, but I shouldn't be in charge because I don't really play Commander that much, so who cares? The backlash was ridiculous. People should be ashamed of themselves for being even just mean. If you're being mean to somebody that you don't know on the internet, you should be ashamed of yourself. You should be more than ashamed of yourself if you're making any kind of threats to any strangers over a card game. That's preposterous. I think we need to be circumspect about the fact that Wizards of the Coast makes so much money on this game by manufacturing scarcity, by making it addictive, by promising consumption as a means to express yourself and being designed to prey on the gambling addictive parts of people's brains that make them get absolutely sucked in. I think that's a bad thing about the game and I don't have an easy solution, but it's something I don't hear talked about that much. I think that the rules committee basically already was a proxy for Wizards of the Coast mostly. So the fact that it's now not anymore and the the format is just controlled by Wizards of the Coast, I think is Honestly, not as big of a change as it might seem, and ultimately probably fine for the format. I think the four-tier system is a well-reasoned and probably the best possible attempt at a solution to a intractable problem that Wizards of the Coast is faced with, which is their most popular format being fundamentally flawed. Intractable. That's that's a good word. That's what we were looking for. Great summary. You said you would ban the cards. I mean, you said no, you you I, said you I, love the backlash. You thought it was good that everyone gave death threats to Olivia. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, I don't know if I would. If I mean, if I was put in that position and you said, "Should we ban these cards?" I would probably say, "I don't want to deal with that backlash." Like, I don't want to hold that hot potato. That's not for me. And do I think the format's better for them being banned? I don't know. I'm not going to play it. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> there we go. That's my summary. I'll play it occasionally. Oh, my last summary point: Rule Zero has never been a thing. It doesn't work. It is a way to launder responsibility for a ban list or a set of rules in this case. It's true of anything in your life. If you agree on something with a consenting adult, you may do whatever you want. This is my rule zero for you for your entire life. (laughs) Go forth and do whatever you want in Magic the Gathering or otherwise. And the real takeaway, Anthony, is that I truly believe Cube is the embodiment of so many of the things that people are trying to make Commander be. It is the casual magic format where you actually can play whatever card you want, where you actually can play at whatever power level you want that is completely and carefully controlled with no burden of weird social communication or rule zero conversations or whatever. And we are hindered by the fact that there are tons of logistical challenges, both perceived and real, to get more people into our format. Yeah, I think critically it also lets you solve, if you want, a lot of the the challenges that are presented by playing an eternal format, which is something that Mark Rosewater's talked about a lot. And really the the challenge is that your format becomes a format of mistakes, because if players are playing the most optimized set of cards, they're playing the mana crypts that, you know, was just some weird old card that happens to be super powerful. But because Cube lets you actually with a group of people choose what those cards are you're playing with uh you can really make it whatever you want so you get those creative aspects without worrying about those eternal world problems which was he was saying ban cards are you know bad we try and avoid these mistakes and we've talked about nadu and nadu was just like a complete oversight on our part like that wasn't us intentionally trying to push boundaries and like getting it a little wrong we just like our internal systems failed or whatever and he was like but also ban cards become some of people's favorite cards that's and true he's like if you look at any cube it's just a laundry list of all of our design mistakes and i'm like damn sick burn mm-hmm. on the average cube but Aaron one Forsyth. probe is not the problem that you know <laughs> four in every deck is 
Oh, uh, there's a whole other topic for another day, Anthony. Design mistakes in Cube because I agree completely. One Cataxian probe is totally fine, but I also think one Minskaboo, not totally fine. That's that's really <laughs> one true. fourth oh, Aerolingus, not fine. Minskaboo. All right. <clears throat> that's it for this episode of Lucky Paper Radio. I'm very certain we didn't read any card rules text, so we couldn't have possibly gotten anything wrong on this one. Let us know in the comments, though, if you are interested to hear our takes on stuff like this in the future, or if the next time there's a giant brouhaha in the magic community writ large, we should simply record an episode about how cool Portent is. That's also an option on the table. All of our music is produced by DJ James Nasty. All the magic cards are produced by Wizards of the Coast. This podcast is produced by thinking really hard about magic cards and the surrounding social dynamics. Anthony, thank you for the gift of friendship and for the gift of cube. Thank you for talking about this big, messy topic with me.